Sister Alia, welcome back. Thank you, thank you. Now, you told me in the last episode uh, about the, how the journey to Islam started. Now we want to begin from post-Shahada. When you uh, said the kalima, said the shahada and became a Muslim, um, you went uh, through an experience that I would love uh, to hear from you. That's a, it's an interesting word, experience. It, yeah. it definitely has been an experience. So, uh, yes, I took my shahada coming up to 23 years ago, alhamdulillah. Um, as I said, I think I was quite naive. Uh, here I was, uh, a new Muslim, young, uh, having adopted Islam from a rational place, you know, a place of conviction. And I thought that um, I had found, not only had I found God, I had found my purpose and I was upon the right path. And if you're on the, upon the right path and everything's going to be rosy. And I think immediately, the tests started to come, and I think, and I, and I actually say this to to new Muslims now that you know expect this, you will be tested. You know. And by the way, it's I mean probably you didn't know that at the time, but I'm sure you know it uh, now that prophets themselves Absolutely. were tested. The followers of prophets were always tested and severely. Yes, yes, it's a, it's a I call it a sunnah of life. Yeah. You know, you're going to be tested. I say that you you you're. In one of three states, you were either tested, you are being tested, or you will be tested. This is the nature of life. Um, I just thought, I don't know, like I said, very, um, I was very naive that things would be easy. Um, I found myself at a very young age, a new Muslim, hardly knowing anything. I, was act I actually came into, Islam via uh, a political group and I was kind of thrown into Islamic polit political activism very very early on without yet building the without even knowledge. knowing how to pray <laughs> properly <laughs> yes without laying the foundations and I think that led to a, a lot of the issues um, but one thing I have to say as a result of as a result of that type of beginning is that it placed a great deal of love and concern in my heart for the Ummah. Mm. Um, and I and I credit that to 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 that to that group. Um, my my relationship with my father was still the same. Um, I think he was actually quite embarrassed that I had become Muslim and distanced himself even more. Because um, you reminded him of himself. Uh, possibly, possibly. I didn't even think of his roots. That way. Possibly, possibly. Um, I mean, he's still non-Muslim today, um, but yes. So that that created even more distance. He, the way that he spoke to me was as though I needed to to, to uh, take permission from him to take such a step, and he was quite upset that I hadn't. My mum. Uh, thought that it was a phase. Uh, she had remarried. And at the time, her and her husband initially were just, they just thought it was a phase. But then the hatred, their hatred for Islam Subhan. manifested in. And you were still living with way. them? I, I was. I was living with them after I became Muslim. Um, and her husband at the time uh, made my life hell absolute hell. Um, I was ridiculed, I was criticised, um, uh, uh, alcohol was deliberately put onto the table, um, they would, um, uh, you know, they, would, they wouldn't eat certain foods, but they would ensure that they ate pork and placed it on the table, um, arguments, uh, sometimes he became physical, to the point that um, he, he and my mother decided that I could no longer live at home. They threw you out? They, they gave me an ultimatum. They gave me an ultimatum. I ended up leaving home um, and subhanAllah, I remember coming back to my mum 
and saying to her, please don't do this. You know, she was really all I had. Having not had a close relationship with my father, my relationship with my mum was everything. And she said to me, she said, she looked me in the eye and she said to me, you're now on your own. I've, do, I've, I've done everything I can for you. You are now on your own. And that's it. And she completely cut off. Um, I think to hear your own mother... Uh, she disowned you. Disown you. Disown you. Um, and look, almost like look through you when you were there. I think that's, uh, that's probably one of the hardest things um, to go through. After that, I, I was quite broken. Um, and I found myself going through some very, very dark uh, experiences, some of which are, are quite personal, so I don't really want to go into detail, but I... Where did you go? I, I lived, I, I always tell people, after, after I became Muslim, I lived in over 20 different places. There was no sense of home. I moved around like you cannot believe. And I think as a very young woman, and then as a, as a new Muslim, you know, you want that sense of belonging and it wasn't there. And so I had to cope and learn how to survive from a very, very young age. Um, as I said, I went through some very, very dark experiences and I found myself living outside of London in Birmingham. Um, as I said, the, the experiences that led me there are quite personal, but I actually was in hospital. And I... In hospital I as was, a patient? I, as a patient, yes, as a patient. Um, and I contacted, at that time I was completely alone, completely broken. I had gone through some really, really um, dark times in a very short period of time after I had become Muslim, found myself in hospital and I had, I had had enough. I couldn't take it anymore. I couldn't take it. And I called my mum. So imagine, this, this is a, a few years later now. I called my mum. And I said, please come and get me. I need to come home. And she came. She came. And we had a chat. And she said, look how, look, look at what you've been through since you've become Muslim. She blamed it on of Islam. Of course, as they do. As mm -hmm. they do. Look at what you've gone through. Um, she, said, just, she said, don't just come home. Come home. Come back. Come home. <laughs> And I went home and I removed my hijab. I stopped praying. I changed my telephone number. I cut off from uh, the community, but I still maintained my belief because like I said, I was rationally convinced. And for the next uh, year and a half, I went back to my old lifestyle. My mum obviously was over the moon. She had her daughter back. And though I no longer practiced Islam, it, I, I still, if anyone would ask me, you know, what faith do you follow? I was still a Muslim. And uh, that, that period was quite interesting because I was free. I could, I could, I was, I was accepted by my family again, you know, um, I was no longer alone. I could do what I wanted. I could dress how I wanted. But in the, in, in the, in the period of hardship that preceded this, you should have been provided with support by the Muslim community. You would think so. You would think so. The, the Muslim community at that time was very critical. Things, you know, Islam was very black and white. You either, you know, you either follow and you do or you don't or, or you're ostracized by the mm. community. And I think, you know, now in, you know, in, in, in um, the year that we're in, you know, there, there's, there's more understanding of the psychology mm. um, uh, of, of the human being. And that wasn't there at that time. But that's, be, that's because of the experience of people like you and other reverts or converts who go through that, that hardship that for us, people who are born as Muslim, we don't experience. Mm, yeah, I, 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 it's with purpose. Everything is with purpose, mm. as I said. And so how long did it take you? 
So that year and that about about a year and a half to two years of of you know doing whatever I wanted to do, feeling like I'm free, distancing myself from the tests and the problems that I went through, you know. But after some time of being free, you question: Is this actually freedom? Mm. Is this actually freedom? Following your own, you know, whims and desires. Is this freedom or are you actually just chained to your desires? You know, what is freedom? You question that. And again, Islam was always in my heart. It was always there. And after a while, the way that I was living, it, it, was no, it wasn't fulfilling me. I don't think it even fulfilled me. I think it was an escape from, from the, the very dark and hard times that I went through, if I'm totally honest. You needed a shelter and that shelter was at a price. Mm, yeah. I guess so, I guess so. So after some time, I started to feel empty. And I, I knew that this was because I was, I, I had lost that connection with Allah Azza wa Jal. That, that's it. And so I remember I started, I picked up the Quran again. And I started to read the Quran again. And I would take myself on walks through parks and just, you know, look at the, the, the perfect and beautiful nature, the, the perfect and beautiful creation. And then I would read just one page of Quran. In, 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 at that time, I could read it in Arabic. So I would read it in Arabic and then I would read the translation. Oh, you had learned Arabic? Oh, yes, 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 I had learned. Mm. Yes, I learned quite early on. Um, and, you know, when people ask me about my Shahada, that was an amazing time. But honestly, coming back to Allah at that time was so sweet because it wasn't as a result of a group. It wasn't as a result of dawah. It was, it was a very intimate and close relationship between me and my creator. And, and, and I did it gradually. And this is, this, is, this is very important for many reverts that they take their life post-shahada Gradually, they, 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 they implement the changes gradually. You know, when we, when we look at the Quran, it was revealed gradually for a purpose because mm. Allah knows the human condition, that the human being cannot take it all on at once. They have to do it on a gradual basis. And this is very important for reverts. So yes, yeah, so I started to read the Quran. Then I started to pray again. And then I, then I started to wear hijab again. And I started to read. And it was, it was just me and my Lord. And it was a very, very beautiful time. Um, Were you by then out of the house or still? Yeah, I was living by myself. I was working. Yeah, yeah so I, was, I was living by myself. Um, you, you were free from the, from the sort of pressure that existed before. Yes, yes, I, I, I was. And um, I, it, my mother was not happy, of course. She couldn't understand how I, would, how I could go back. But the relationship wasn't as sour as it had been. Um, and subhanAllah, after I, after I came back and I started practicing again, I went through, again, a number of tests. But this time it was with, it was knowing that when you sign on the dotted line between you and Allah, this is part of the equation. Yes. This is part of the agreement. It's part of the contract. Inevitable. And as long as you have Allah, you can get through anything. Um, and then, you know, I, I, my, my, my life continued. Um, I got married. I had children. Um, and, you know, uh, my life became about my children uh, and raising them. And like I said, a number of tests along the way. Um, but I noticed, I noticed uh, a trend. I noticed that there was such celebration within the community and amongst the ummah at someone embracing Islam. In fact, when someone would embrace Islam, you know, the people would rush to them, hug them, kiss them, tell them, if you need anything, I'm here, I'll give it to you. And then weeks, a couple of weeks go by and there's silence. And the, uh, uh, the majority of new Muslims experience this, that there's such celebration of them coming into Islam and promises. But no follow up. No follow up. And it's at this crucial time 
where they're transitioning from one identity into another, when they're transitioning from one life to another, that they need all the support that they can get. And I saw, I mean, obviously with my own experience, but also seeing the experience of other brothers and sisters around me, people that I knew personally, that this was something that was, uh, 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 that was an experience of so many. Mm. And what was being done, you know? Uh, when we when we when we look back to the Sira, the the Ansar were supports the to the Muhajirin. Where where is our support? And this is needed. And it was Ramadan, Ramadan two thousand and ten. And I had uh, I had an idea. It just came to me. But this idea that just came to me in my mind. Uh, was accompanied by, I can only, because I've experienced it a number of times over the years, it was accompanied by a physical sensation, almost like something was pushing me. And I, as I said, I've had this a number of times, it's always led to something, subhanAllah. And this idea came to me in Ramadan where I said, there has to be a structured support service for those who come into the faith. There has to be something that supports them. If they find themselves homeless, there is this organization that supports them. If they find themselves having lost their job, there's this organization that supports them. If they find themselves um, rejected and abandoned by their family, this organization supports them and so on and so on. So I, I had this idea and I grabbed a piece of paper and a pen and I began to brainstorm. And this was in, the, in Ramadan and I just carried, I just, everything was coming to me, you know, all of these ideas. And I was just brainstorming and writing and writing. And then I sat with it. And I, and I, had, I had this vision and I thought, this, it has to happen. It has to happen. Um, was that uh, motivated by your own personal experience or by the experience of others as well? Both. 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 Obviously, when you go through something yourself and you're associated into an experience, you know, the motivations and the passions that come from that are stronger. But it's see it was seeing, it was seeing other, other, particularly other Muslim women who were younger than me going through similar experiences mm. that I had. And, and then, you know, that triggers you and you think, no, I, I, I can't allow another girl or woman to go through what I went through alone, you know. And so what, what, did, I, what did I do? I, I, I said, I, I have to do this. And I made wudu. I pray. I, I made wudu. I prayed to rakat and I prayed istikhara. Then I, I emailed, I think, about 20 20 friends and said, you know, I have this idea. I have this idea. This is my vision. This is the mission. You know, who wants to join me? And only a handful of them did. Converts? Uh, a mixture. But oh. majority, ma majority were converts as well. And within three months, we launched Solace. And Solace is uh, the registered charity with the Charities Commission that I run today. So, so it's, it's nearly 12 years old now? It's, uh, ele yeah, 11, it's 11 years old. 11 it's 11 years, years old, yeah, because we launched in, in 2011. Um, and yeah, so we've been, we've, we've, we've been supporting Revert Sisters from all over the world. And this is based where, in East London? So we, we, we are registered with the Charities Commission, which operates for England and Wales. But we actually, um, I, we, I often joke that we were the pioneers of remote working because we never actually had an office. We wanted to save on the costs and actually give and use those so funds. So you, you just work from home and so, communicate among yourselves. So, yeah, so we, so we, we are based in, in, in the UK and we also have a branch in the Netherlands now. And we're also expanding to, to other countries sure. as well. And we are a charity that we, we're not here to educate new Muslims because there are so many organizations that do that. We are here to support revert uh, uh, women or convert, convert women who find themselves in difficulty post-Shahada. That is our remit. And although we are a UK-based charity, we have received requests for support from 
uh, converts from all over the world. And I think there's a continent that we that have. How, how do they learn about you from a website? So we have a website, we're on social media, um, and we're known to be, you know, to be a charity that focuses on the difficulties that these women go through post-Shahada because we, we can't continue to just celebrate the Shahada and then drop these women. And, but this is what's happening. And were people to know some of the stories that these women go through, they would cry, really. And they shouldn't have to go through these problems alone. So yes, so so this do you is you have, what we do. Do you, do you have I mean, do you, do you have figures or statistics? How many how many women go through your project? Uh, how many how many of them you deal with? So we we have I mean we have uh, obviously different services that we provide for for uh, our beneficiaries, but we have supported thousands of of convert women over the years. Some of them have found themselves on the streets. I remember one particular case. Um, where she was with her a few bags and a suitcase sleeping on a park bench. This is, this is someone that has, has uh, testified to La ilaha illallah and she's finding herself sleeping on a park bench. You know, we have had sisters, we had a sister, this, I think this is probably the mo one of the most harrowing cases. Um, she was a, a, a convert from a, a, a Sikh background and actually the Hindu and Sikh converts go through, I think, one of the most mm. difficult and testing times as new Muslims. She was imprisoned in her Their own home. Their families don't tolerate them. Oh, all. she was imprisoned. She was beaten up. Her phone was taken away from her. And somehow she managed to send a message to a friend who contacted us to support her. We've had... Um, we've had uh, sisters who, 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 you know, who are who are converts, who find themselves married to abusive partners, who have lost their children to social services. The children have been adopted. The list goes on and on. And so, you see, it's these types of things that we don't speak about. When we speak mm -hmm. about converts and reverts, we we hear about their stories. We celebrate the journey, but it doesn't end there. That's just the beginning. True. There's a long story, there's a long line of events, and we have to offer them support. Now, what, what sort of assistance do you provide? Of course, you don't have a shelter. No, if only we, that's one of our dreams actually, is mm. to have a solace house where we can, we can provide a shelter for these sisters. But we provide emotional support. We, we provide, um, we, we liaise with um, social services, we provide financial support, we provide emergency shelter, um, uh, not in our own shelter, but we provide emergency uh, shelter for With those. families or? Um, no, so we, we, we use the donations. We've, we've always been funded just by the kind donations um, of our brothers and sisters within the community. But if we, if we get a call in the middle of the night, we place that sister safely in a hotel, first of all, just mm. to get her off the streets. Um, and the homelessness could be as a result of being kicked out by her family. It could be um, due to domestic violence. It could be, um, it, it, it could, it could be um, you know, in, in the case of this uh, sister, uh, this ex-Sikh uh, sister, you know, just having nowhere to go. Um, we, uh, we support single mothers. And this is this is something that's very uh, very important for us. You can imagine a sister doesn't have a family backing, so if she is a single mother with her children, who who is there to support her in raising the next generation? Do you have examples of single mothers embracing Islam, or they, you're talking about divorcees or both? Both, mm. yes, both. We have had. Um, women who have become Muslim later on in life, and and the thing is about solace, is that we we not we do not only cater for the new muslim we cater for uh, uh these women who have been muslim 5 10 15 years because the post shahada problems can can run into yeah. many many years um we've recently provided a business training that was attended by many single mothers in order to uh help uh, uh, uh these sisters set up their own business so they can go on to provide for their families uh, there are so many, so many services that we offer. We're currently working towards a really exciting project, and that is the um, Solace Marriage Project. 
And the reason why this is exciting is because a lot of the issues that um, women go through who have converted to Islam stem from not having a family behind them when they are looking to get married. They're taken advantage of. They are mm. abused. They don't even know how, to, how the, the, the um, Islamic marriage process works. And, a lot, and, and it, it really, really hurts me to my core to find these sisters in a vulnerable situation taken advantage of because the Muslim man knows that she doesn't have a father behind her, a Muslim father behind her. Yeah. She doesn't have a Muslim brother behind her. And he treats her in ways that you cannot imagine. I mean, I have so many stories. So we're, we're actually creating a comprehensive system where, uh, where Solace provides them with a surrogate family, so to speak, to take them through the entire marriage process, to do the vetting that a father would do for his daughter, to ensure that she is, she's treasured. And this is one of the beauties of Islam, that, you know, that, that Islam, in, you know, values the woman so much as a mother, as a daughter, as a wife. And, and often it's the family that, that carries that value and maintains that value. But if a woman doesn't have that family backing, who's there to do that? So we're stepping in and we're creating comprehensive system to, to be able to do that. So there's many, many things that we do. But as I said, it's all focused upon supporting her post Shahada so that she continues to live with Islam in, in, in the passionate way that she embraced it. You know, we don't want these sisters because we don't, we don't want these sisters to lose the zeal. People talk about the numbers becoming Muslim they don't talk about the numbers leaving Islam. Mm. And a lot of these sisters go through these problems and end up leaving Islam. And we don't want to do that. If we can step in and we can help them to, 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 make, to, to remain upon the deen, then we've done our job, inshallah. I hope the day will come when we will see a big mansion with the name oh, Solis. Oh, that would be amazing. Make du'a, make du'a. That would be absolutely amazing, inshallah. Thank you very much, Sister Alia. I'm no. really delighted to have had you uh, on the program. It's been an honor. Thank you very Thank you. much. Jazakallah khair.